Okay, uh, without further ado, I'd like to welcome Gino. Are you up first? Okay, welcome Gino. And um, I'm very much looking forward to hearing what you have to say from the University, uh, Nelson Mandela University. Thank you. Thank you. Afternoon, everyone. So is it just me or have the last few years been really, really tough? Um, please, raise your hands if it's been tough for you. So it's everyone who share this, right? Uh, thank you. I'm not afraid to say that it's been really tough for me, personally, professionally, and socially. And to all of us who have lost and mourned, my condolences, and I hope it gets better. Dear attendees here at the Knowledge Equity Network, Global Summit at Leeds University, hashtag Ken 2022 if you're online or if you're sitting in the room, please. Social media. Hello to the online viewers around the world. Welcome streamers, <laughs> listeners, friends, and all. We are emerging from what has been a communally experienced tragedy. And I characterize it here as an experience that we all shared. However, it was an experience that created a hyper sense of loneliness. Um, and it seems to have set up a much more pronounced sense of being an individual. Sadly, for many of us, it's also manifested in our disconnecting from the community. Maybe it's a loss of sharing in humanity. In academic research, we often motivate students and researchers to imagine a golden thread running through their writing. It can be a short strand, like a meaning or a point connecting two paragraphs and making half a page of a clearly set out meaning. It could be a series of chapters set into a compilation that presents a perspective shared by many, told using various devices. It could be a thesis, tightly defining and describing one particular element. Here, granular details and varying vantage points combine and connect to clarify and depict a core element the author or speaker wants to share. Like me, here, today, now. It's a line that connects things. It's a connecting strand that helps to build upon what's come before and may come after by making direct connections between elements, right? This golden thread helps us to be part of an argument or statement and to further the essential meaning they have when they are put together. To me, that connection here is us. It's people. Not a me, not an I, but a we. It's an us. Today, I want to turn me and you into we and speak about us. I'm from the Open Education Influences Project at Nelson Mandela University. It's a student advocacy through action, empowerment program that innovates education through action. I live in South Africa and I am an African. And we share a philosophy with others as a way to describe and motivate a shared perspective as a community-based understanding of the value of a society facing life. Do you know what it is? What? Ubuntu. There are many understandings of Ubuntu out there. And many are a derivative, watered down version of an essential meaning. I am because we are. It's lovely. At this point, I want to pause as I paint a picture. You can close your eyes and listen to my voice, but otherwise just watch and listen, right? Picture a watering hole in the middle of an African bush felt. Think a movie landscape if you haven't been to Africa. I mean, I live there, I see this every day. A wilderness landscape with a beautiful, imperfect loop of water surrounded by a brief expanse of wet and sandy shore. Visualize croppings of brown grasses fluttering in a dry breeze, right? And the occasional thorny bush shown up with a leafy tree. Gently, waves lap at the water's edge, where animals of all kinds are gathered to drink from the source. In your vision, let's only focus on the elephant, the lion, some mammals, and a few insects, all at the water's edge. And with, that's where we are now, right? The water's edge. Of course, each animal has their own way of drinking, of consumption. The elephant's sip is big, reaching far into the fresh, flowing water. And when its trunk takes a big gulp, the water level actually recedes. That means that some of the smaller animals need to move forward to reach the new water's edge. 
in front of them newly exposed though, that soil is wet, it's muddy, there's a fear of treading on this new ground. And as the elephant drinks, he's full and steps back to move towards that tree. Water fills some of the footprints it leaves behind. The smaller animals rush towards these pools and start to drink. For some of them, these are crater-like pools of water. But the water's brown and it's muddy and the edges of the pool often cave in and some of the smaller animals fall in and drown. Hmm. But thirst prevails and the surviving animals keep drinking murky water which is now littered with some dead bodies. Now the dark side. Remembering how fresh and clean its drink was though, the elephant reaches into a huge tree and tears off a branch. The branch is well selected and it's one with many stems. The stems reach out like arms and all along at the ends they have twigs which act like fingers. Hundreds of fingers and then thousands of leaves. Hmm. The elephant walks back to the water and places the branch on the shore. With the branch now a bridge from the sand and reaching into the water. The stems act as walkways for the smaller animals. The twigs become jetties and keys and the leaves act as docking spaces for the smallest animals to sit, rest and drink from fresh and flowing clean water. Across the way, the lion is roaring. Hmm. But more and more, the once fearful animals see another route to the fresh water. They see others drinking, and now instead of running away, those others come nearer and step onto the stem. If you haven't already, you can open your eyes now. I don't want you to spend the rest of the time sitting like this. <laughs> so when I received the invitation to be part of Ken, and to help support and motivate the realization of the Ken Declaration in my own small and humble way. I was immediately struck by the realization that lots of declarations about good wishes and good deeds and good intentions exist. Think Dakar, think Ljubljana, the European Commission, Berlin, Budapest, Paris, Cape Town, just as some example amongst a plethora of others. What really triggered me was that all too often these statements and plans were co-created and led by people who really didn't have first-hand knowledge in their current spaces of the real reality that needed to be changed and the ways it needed to change so that these declarations reached the ground and had an impact. Hmm. They set out ways that they would do so and that others should adopt. So maybe I was going to be emerging in a landscape of dreams here at Ken. Hmm. It was an anxiety-provoking realization I needed to engage and then overcome. So now I'm telling tales. And let me pause here and ask a question. And this might sound familiar from earlier on. What's the difference between a dream and a hope? Take a few seconds and think hard. What is the difference between a dream and a hope? I'm going to be a provocation for thought, like I was asked to be and try to lead you to consider these points as I complete my talk. I'm, I'm almost there. Remember, you all have a chance to share your considerations, so I'm just going to put these provocations out there. It's a set of six questions okay, or statements. Provocation one, the declaration for many may at, come, at times come across as a dream. If you read one of the aims of enabling global practices, in the declaration it says, working with signatories will deliver a step change in global approaches to higher education, including a move away from competition-focused rankings. Hmm. Think about the elephant. If we think of the storytelling analogy, does that mean the elephant's the same as the smaller animals and the insects then? Moving away from these rankings. Are larger institutions going to be willing to share and support at the same time and let go of being the big player in the field? Provocation two. The knowledge equity network itself to me is the hope. The hope is all of us in this room. It's you online, right? Or watching as a recording. It is you, so what will you do is the question to think about as we go ahead. You should take this dream and make it real. Provocation three, the lion is still roaring. Lead by example, share what you want to do, what you are doing and have done. Share how and help others get closer. Provocation four, what role will students play in your engagement in this network? 
And how will you empower them into spaces where their voices are heard, but meaningfully so, not just because they're students and you want to have them as part of the conversation. Provocation five, to all of these stakeholders in this room and online and watching, understand what open education is. Do you know the terminology? Have you done the homework before you're telling other people what they should do? Number six, if you help the smaller animals get to and then drink water, do they owe you something? Is the bigger animal the boss? Does its help cost the smaller animals something? Uh, Prof Freshwater said this morning, and uh, she said, someone bears the cost, but should it be the smaller animals? So I end up asking, are you the elephant? Are you one of the smaller animals? Are you the lion in the field of open? Prof Batendake spoke about the generosity of larger institutions. And if you don't get it still, they are the elephants in the story. Prof Cooper spoke about publishers and the mechanisms they use to scale away progress at times in the pursuits of us all opening up. The global south is not the only space with smaller animals. This is not location-based. Lots of people need help to open up. So how are we doing this? At Nelson Mandela University, our byline is change the world. And the Knowledge Equity Network needs us, that's you and I, to do just that. Think about it, and then let's talk about opening up with hope after Card and Salt, um, Salt speaks next. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gino. It's lovely. Um, thank you, Karen. I'm going to hand over to you. Fabulous. Um, I want to thank, um, I think, the organizers, uh, those who've been thinking about this, for quite a while um, for reaching out and engaging with me um, and inviting me to participate. Um, I can uh, spend a lot of time telling you about my own research career, uh, my background. Um, I have had a, a slight change in a uh, job title um, where I'm now um, Deputy Director of RNI System Diversity and Security. I could talk about all of that. I could talk about UKRI and what is it it's involved in and, and, and various different things. But we have, we have hours for that. We have more time for that at, at another, at another um, juncture. Um, what I really want to do now is, is more or less just, just think with you, um, I think, about the challenges uh, that are in front of the Knowledge Equity Network, but also really try to maximize this opportunity. What does this ultimately give us? Um, and I, in thinking about what I was going to say today, I spent some time going back to the sort of draft documents and really thinking about that sort of um, collective creativity, co co uh, statements like global collaboration um, uh, and shared community, um, uh, open and equitable. These, these all feel like they are tangible, real things. Um, and uh, and I, was, I was very impressed and um, quite pleased today to, to hear so much critical, really interesting conversations um, from radical collaboration to, to thinking about um, these questions around infrastructure and, uh, and co-design um, and co-commitment. Um, and this brings me to, I think, the thing that probably is the most central for me. Um, <clears throat> now, I know the title of our session, and we could actually probably spend a lot of time talking about um, overcoming the particular barriers uh, or various different forms of inequalities within uh, higher education. Um, but that is really focusing on the outcomes um, or somehow down the line um, because I can't get over the fact, uh, really thinking it from the provocation of Gino, um, about we've got to actually think about this thing. What is this network? How will this network actually function? And what would it, what would it do? Um, and the reason I'm spending time talking about this is mainly because I've become obsessed with structure and infrastructure. I've been really thinking quite a lot about the different things that we create, the ways we try to bring folks together. Um, and then we don't necessarily attend to what I call the piping 
We don't change our processes. We don't change our funding mechanisms. We don't change our governance structures. We don't change how the meetings are, are even conducted. We don't change how the setup is, is, is there. We don't, we, don't, we don't change any of that, but we still expect to have some sort of radical outcome at the end, even though we are pushing things through a process that ultimately reifies various forms of hierarchy and various forms of dislocation um, and disempowerment. So my radical challenge to all of you will be, how will we make sure, or anyone make sure, that the Knowledge Equity Network is built on a foundation of really examining quite critically its processes and protocols, um, how it actually sets up its meeting structure, who gets to contribute and interact, and what does that actually look like, the functional aspects of this, not jumping to the hope, and the, which is beautiful, and the various things at the end, but actually the work itself. Because there's something quite troubling to me when the work is not attended to and everyone is trying to remain focused on the outcome, but yet people are not flourishing in that work. They're not feeling that radical transformation. They're feeling extracted from or they're feeling exploited um, or they're feeling in some ways disempowered. Um, I don't believe that is any of the attention of the network at all, but that is uh, an extremely radical thing to actually start to really critically examine um, how people got here, uh, the mobility and movement of various different types of people. What did the contracts look like for the security guards, for the catering services, um, for, for the cleaning services? Really actually starting to think in that big system infrastructure network way, as opposed to thinking it's all about creating a nice safe document that describes what we might do within a, in a, a particular location. Um, so what could these structures of change look like? Um, how would that uh, radical transformation actually come, 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 come to pass? Um, so that means we need to think about a few things. One quite critical for me is the ethics of care. Who's thinking about that eth ethics of care of people engaged within that network? Um, those contributing, those helping to support, those helping to build, the team back there keeping connected to the folks who are online. Uh, this beautiful world of hybrid, we would, we would be lost without the, 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 the set of IT support. But do they ever get an acknowledgement uh, or a recognition for the ways that they're helping to keep these types of networks alive, right? Um, and the, the same of thinking about a whole set of places that we're able to open up during the midst of the, the, the sort of darkest days of COVID. Um, and that meant a lot of people who were doing health and safety type of work to keep uh, accesses and spaces alive, they were critical to allowing people to come in and to function um, and to interact, especially the folks that had to do that um, because that's the nature of what their roles were. Um, so again, the ethics of care starts to expand this, so this circle of radicalism much, much wider as opposed to thinking about it from a narrow perspective of who might be involved. Um, and that means doing things like, I'm sure folks within the network who are thinking about this, about ethical partnering. What does that actually entail? What is that? How do you build that? And how do you make sure that the types of partnering that you're set up are not transactional um, in terms of actually somebody has to get something from somebody else to engage in that process? And what do you do when that is something that people want um, and they want to move forward? Um, and at the root of this is that real critical question for me is just collaboration. What is just collaboration? We've talked about just transitions. There have been people who've been writing about just sustainability. Um, there's this really interesting kind of dynamic of thinking about justice uh, or reparative aspects or even repair. But what is just uh, collaboration, just partnering, so that we can actually think about infusing the network with those sets of tenets and those sets of values. But again, not just focusing on what the outcomes might be, not just focusing on the shiny things that might be announced and people's declarations, but actually in the work itself um, in terms of moving forward. Uh, if this feels like a bit of everyday um, radical acts, it is. It's living that as lived theory of really having the network have the lived theory to be able to engage in this work and really thinking about that and being very forthright about what that could possibly be in these sets of exchanges and interactions um, with various folks. So that's my provocation, um, I think, as we move into thinking about some of the particulars moving forward, is I am a strong uh, proponent of collaborative practice, co-design, co-commitment, 
But how do we do that in, in atmospheres and spaces and, and in various different domains where, where inequity um, and, uh, and um, division runs rampant in various ways? Well, how do we do that? How do we actually move ourselves forward um, in a way that recognizes all of that, but ultimately wants to try to build and infuse the network with this radical potential um, and this radical change? So hopefully, my set of provocations added to Gino's, I think lays the foundation in front of you that starts to ask a lot of questions about representation, that should ask a lot of questions about identity, um, should ask a lot of questions around how this will ultimately work and be infused with that, that hope and that possibility. But also I think the, what the model of doing this would actually do um, in terms of creating a, a platform or a space for others to move forward. Um, and on that note, it's over to you. Thank you both. That, that, they were really interesting um, provocations, and um, I don't want to distill it down to something because they're huge and important topics. And I, I think, I mean, I know I've got your six, five, six things here, Gino. Um, and I, I was particularly struck by what's our understanding of open education? What does it mean? And it speaks to, we all might think we have the answer to that um, in this ecosystem of how we're operating or, or maybe we're not operating in the way we should be yet. So I think there is, uh, like I said, I don't want to distill it down, but are there any comments on the thought of what is open education and how does this as a network set a model and a standard for, for behaving in the way that you have challenges to think about and behave, Karen. Is that, is that okay as a, as a starter? Okay, thank you. Has anyone got any thoughts or, yes, welcome. Oh yes, sorry, microphones for the colleagues on Zoom. Thank you, Josh Sendall, University of Leeds. Um, this whole conversation's really got me thinking about the the concept of partnership and I kind of think of a partnership as a mutual endeavor for mutual ends um, but something that came through really strongly is, as, as Gino was talking was just the importance of parity in a partnership and if we're going to achieve this in respect of open education open research or indeed achieving the, the UN SDGs then we have to recognize and accept that the contributions of the University of Zurich are as valid as the contributions as the University of Zimbabwe, for example. And I think that's a real challenge because you know we're looking there at power dynamics. In order to do that, I think we have to be able to accept and address some of the structural inequalities that, that exist, but also really promote and project parity in all that we do. Um, and that takes some real honest, critical self-reflection on who we are, how we got here, and where we want to go. So I'm afraid it is just another provocation, um, but hopefully one that can sit with us all as we reflect on this. Yeah, and um, thank you. The, I, um, in the last uh, group we had, we were talking about tackling global challenges through open education. And, um, and I'm going to feed back on this, but one of the things is, how does this stop becoming an echo chamber? We're all, you know, everybody in the room, we're talking to each other. It's like, where are the voices, the, the voices that we, you know, the, where are the missing voices or the voices that should be heard louder? That the insects coming in, the elephants take a step back, you know, sorry. I'm, yeah, uh, was it Kat? Oh, did no, you? I can't see your name, sorry. Fiona. Hi, Fiona McClement, I'm Director of Equality, Diversity, Inclusion at the University of Leeds. Yes, I, I, I thought they were immense, thank you. They were excellent uh, talks and provocations. Um, but one question I put to my colleagues, Kendi and Louise, this morning when we were looking around the room is, um, and I know we, obviously we've, we've, we've got a lot of participants joining us online, so I don't want to make assumptions, but we had empty seats and I just wondered, where are our own junior researchers? Where are our own postdocs today from marginalized, underrepresented, equity-seeking groups? And it just felt a real missed opportunity to me. And Karen made an absolutely excellent point as well in the, the previous session when we were talking about open research. Um, and it not being a passport, I wrote this down for underrepresented groups and it being more risky. 
And I just feel we're missing a bit of a trick today here, actually, in terms of voices, different voices contributing this conversation. So I would have liked to see more of the seats this morning filled by some of our own uh, yeah, junior researchers from underrepresented groups, for example. Thank you, Fiona. Thank you. I'm going to go to Kat, then Nick. I don't know who was first. Is that OK? Thank you. Hi, Kat Davis, yeah. Dean for Research Culture here at the University of Leeds. Um, thanks, Karen. It was really good to hear about um, the nuts and bolts, I guess, of how we do the work. Um, I enjoy the high-level strategic conversations, but I really like working out how we're actually going to do it. Um, so I think you know this network represents incredible richness <clears throat> in terms of um, ways of working, I suppose you might put it. And I would appeal to all of the members to you know, look within your own institutions, but also remembering that we are probably all institutionalized. <laughs> so talk to your um, private sector colleagues, people that work in completely different sectors. How do they arrange meetings? You know, we had an agendaless meeting <laughs> recently. That was a first for me um, and really worthwhile. Um, this morning, or sorry, in the previous session, um, somebody raised the possibility of opening recruitment panels out publicly, things like that. Uh, we pre-release interview questions to some of our interview candidates um, in advance. We run open exams. We have co-written codes of conduct in uh, research labs. We're doing more open peer review. So I would really like to, I guess, make a bit of a shopping list, really, of um, open ways of working. And I think Ken needs to be absolutely saturated in open from top to bottom. Thank you. Thank you, Kat. I'm going to go to Nick, and then I'm going to go to a colleague online. Thanks, Nick. Thank you very much, Nick Plant, uh, University of Leeds. One of the things I picked up really strongly this morning um, from a number of the speakers and in the panel session was this, this need to recognize different knowledge bases and different ways of thinking and approaching questions. I think we're saying the same thing here in that uh, I'd go further than Fiona and go, actually, one of the, one of the solutions is we have to commit to talking to our local neighbourhoods. We have to commit to, before we can even say what is open education, don't ask me, go and ask somebody in Hare Hills, one of the most deprived areas in Leeds, what is education to them? Because if I want equity of education, equity of research, then I need to be reaching them, not me, because I'm already here. So I think for me, the, the commitment from the network and its partners is to actively go out and ask its communities what it requires to be able to achieve equity. And very quickly, in, in response to Gina's provocation, can I be the branch? <laughs> yeah, and also on that, I'm just going to come to this person online, but I was, I was thinking, as you were saying that, Nick, it's also, it's also r interesting to learn what other what education means at a local level in Pretoria and, you know, all of the colleagues in the room, different places they're representing in, in Scandinavia so that we all understand where the base, where, the, where that line is for everybody. Right, sorry, online. Yes. Welcome, colleague. We have uh, Sotaro Keita online. Sotaro, do you want to put your camera on? Thank you. Hello, well, thank you. Uh, Sotaro Keita from University of Warwick. Um, so, so, I'm, so I am slightly troubled by the title of this session. Um, how's it called? Um, sort of reducing inequality through open education. And uh, so that seemed to imply to me that, you know, the knowledge that, you know, this big, you know, universities in rich Western countries, the knowledge that we have is globally useful. And uh, and I you know my, my own field is psychology and in psychology there is a kind of a critical reflection in the last ten years or so that the uh, all the things we know about human behavior almost all the knowledge that we have accumulated is from you know studying white people in rich Western countries and uh, and there is a real reflection critical reflection on this in psychology and I think we need to kind of carefully think about you know, how we are generating knowledge in our own universities. 
And uh, so, so, th so that's sort of one thing um, that I want to kind of throw in in the discussion. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to come to you, Gino, and, and also ask colleagues to respond. Yeah. Mm. Um, Prof. Plant, I'd like to, I'd like to just, um, firstly, yes, please be the branch. Um, I think that we need people who, with, with connectors who are able to put that out so that other people have access. So that's access and that's sharing. Um, I'm going to name drop someone from the University of Cape Town because we're busy with an open textbook fellowship at Nelson Mandela University. We're creating open textbooks for the benefit of the academic project. And students are co-creators here. They're leading this project. And we, we're really troubled by the fact that there isn't really an uptake from the staff because staff are still doing this. They're closed where, where knowledge sharing is concerned. And we cannot change personal behaviors in that way. But what Michelle Wilmers from the Digital Open Textbooks for Development project at UCT said last week when I shared that with her, maybe um, because I speak about opening up, not open education. And she encapsulated that by saying, maybe it's more important to look at process and not product. Mm. So we need to look at behaviors and changing behaviors and supporting that change, not transformative uh, agreements like an open access, but transitional, transitioning. So it's an action and it's, it's, it's ongoing and it's a process and activity. And, and I'm just putting that out there like for thought. And also I think that speaks to our caller online. It's like, how is this knowledge produced? You know, where, where is this knowledge coming from, this open? And, and as you said, Karen, don't fix on the end point. We're not looking... At, we need to look at the pipe work, I think, is what you said. Yeah. Something so, like I that. I mean, well, I, I, it's a couple of different... Well, A, is, it's, it's a nice pun, um, talking about piping. Um, <laughs> uh, well, I mean, unless you're in a factory or, or sometimes in rooms like this, a lot of this stuff's covered, right? And you just don't ever see it. Yeah. Um, so it became a way for me to talk about... Uh, collaboration agreements, uh, tech transfer, um, knowledge exchange type of activities in language that people might understand, but they don't, they're not asking about how that agreement gets made or who does it, because it happens somewhere else, right? If they're, if they're involved in research um, or impact or even engagement work, somebody else takes care of it and then it just shows up and they're able to just do what they need to do, as opposed to thinking about radically rechanging that. But I've been able to broaden that out to really think about a whole bunch of different things as we start to think about how do you engage with others? How do you create relationships? And, and how, does that, how, do you, how do you try to understand how those relationships work? And for some, it's decision making. So they may be thinking quite carefully about who gets to make decisions, um, how are those decisions shared, and then, and then ultimately, um, or knowledge production. But I'd even go back to Nick's point. Um, you were, I mean, I think you were very um, clear about going out and asking others. You could actually make that a fundamental feature of the governance of the network, is that that co is not a co amongst the, the network universities having the co. The co is as big as we can make it, right? But you have to govern that. I and mean, this is the part mm -hmm. that I think is, I don't mean in governance in terms of uh, top down, but somebody has to hold that space to be able to allow that exchange to happen and deal with all of the mistrust, distrust, uncertainty, uh, uh, histories, the tension points, and, and you've got to find a, a way to process your way forward. So it is practical, but it's process, and it's powerful to do that. It's powerful to actually, but, but in, and to do it in a way that it's intentional, that you're recognizing what that is. And I can't imagine a network that is trying to be global around any form of knowledge production and education that doesn't take into consideration everything that we've all talked about, the fact that certain sets of people weren't allowed to get certain sets of educations, that certain people can't step into certain sets of buildings still in certain places globally. Um, so we're, we're not talking about a space that is just open and all we need to do is put some products there and some assets and it'll sort itself out. We're, we're really working against a lot of forces. Um, and, and, and to do that with intention about how to hold that space of tension is, is to me will be the most powerful thing the network can do. Yes to the outcomes and the actual work itself, but the model how to do that of, across all mm. these dynamic spaces, there is power there. Mm. Um, and, that, and that's a demonstrator project, right? It's a demonstrator to countries and to other organizations and institutions that this is possible. Can I just ask Karen, have you seen an example of this? 
where it's, I mean, nothing's perfect, right? But have you seen yeah. something where... I mean, it depends on what the scale is. Uh, so there's, there's been quite a lot of ethics work, uh, ethics of care work in cultural organizations. We're seeing them sprout up um, in the US where people are really now starting to think a lot. And, and for them, it's a lot of contracts. So they're really thinking about what those contracts do and, and the sets of relationships. You see elements of it in things like in the UK, there's like a, a technician's commitment. There's various different concordats. You can see elements of it. but a lot of that doesn't really get into the, the, the practical, right? In terms of how that is actually going to work as opposed to governing outcome, right? And governing, uh, governing a, 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 an intervention or a, some, some sort of solution. Um, so I think as people are getting into thinking about governance now, and um, you can see it maybe like in, in the participatory uh, work where people are doing participatory um, collaboration um, or uh, PPE, that it, as it's called in the, in, um, the health services in the, in, the, in the UK. But even that doesn't have the governance part sorted. Um, it's got the participation part um, understood, but not how the, those things are ultimately set up. And I think this is the sweet spot um, uh, at the moment as we look at all sorts of sectors working on a lot of the same sets of things, but often not attending to this as an issue. Mm. Thank you. I, do you know what's slightly filling my thoughts is how am I going to do you justice when I have to feed back to main <laughs> plenary because there's so much there. I might call upon you both to, uh, to chip in. So what do, what do we, this is a big challenge and this is a, not a direction I necessarily thought this conversation would go in, but I, I you know, it, it's exciting and different and hearing these different perspectives. What are others' thoughts about either examples they've seen or maybe how this might be challenging? Because it's, you've already said, there's, 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 there's pockets of it, but there's no sweet spot that holds that tension of the, how, how something like this grows. Any thoughts on how to, become a living lab as, a, as the network? Yes. Oh, sorry, is there anybody on? Yeah, sorry. Um, Welcome. Kendi Guantai from University of Leeds. Um, Gina was giving me the eye. Those ones of you must speak, so here I am. Not <laughs> having completed the thought, but hey ho. Um, <laughs> yeah, so the thing that I'm sort of thinking about and just listening to even just what Karen was just saying now is how are we really going to do this? Because we exist within a context where knowledge and education has been commoditized, where we are in a marketplace, where we have products, um, education itself, as we say education, it's no longer that pursuit for knowledge it's not the process, it's the outcome. And we are just sort of selling this and when students come through the door, they say I want to graduate with a degree that is such a good degree so that I can go get a job. Um, so that then I can, in a sense, take this degree and um, turn it into money and a lifestyle and so on and so forth. And so wanting to do all of this work is amazing, but practically how do we do it? I don't have the answer. The other thing is because of the way we commoditize education and the way we commoditize knowledge, we've already left so many people out. And like Nick said, those people don't even know where to start. Um, we exist at the, at the, as the University of Leeds within a beautiful, amazing, diverse community, but we are still this ivory tower, almost literally, because you can see our building from almost everywhere in Leeds. And a lot of people never set foot here because they're very afraid. Yeah. And those partnerships that we build are not meaningful. So how do we start to bring those voices in really practical ways? Mm. And also we have a tendency to go out when we haven't finished within. So maybe perhaps in answer to your question, charity begins at home. We have people working in various levels of this university, people whose skills we don't even know. So we were speaking again with Louise, my Dean, and with Fiona talking about how many hidden talents and skills that we have in this organization. People who come in through perhaps, for instance, a sanctuary sort of umbrella, asylum seekers yeah. and so on. And they de -skill. They come here, they don't speak the language, they may have degrees and skills and talents and all that, and they don't know that that's relevant in this space. So they never speak of it, 
right? And then they come and they're doing a cleaning job, they're serving us, they're doing all, the, we have no clue. And we don't even ask them. We don't include them in conversations. We don't, today Simone, it was amazing that she had a conversation with a security guard and she learned something. And that, that was amazing. And when she brought it in, she acknowledged that security guard. How many people do we have in our own spaces who have those, not that knowledge and those skills? We don't consult with them. We are here now, where are they? Yeah. We are, where are they? So we, um, I think there's space also for decolonization and for the histories that you talked about. And for creating a vessel that is big enough to hold everybody, rather than having this fear, this deficit of if I give, then I don't have. Ubuntu means if I grow, you grow. Uh, your, your, your success can never diminish me, you know. And um, the watering hole that we talked about, that uh, Dino so beautifully talked about, I love circles, Nick knows this. I always talk about circles because they have no hierarchy, right? And I love that. But then the thing is, when we are drinking from that watering hole where all the animals are around, sometimes we see the diminishing resource as the water goes in, we forget it's going to rain. We forget there might be water coming from underground. How do we keep this resource going so that it is enough for all of us to drink of it? But if we see it as a diminishing resource, that is where the problem is. Yeah, Lovely. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm going to hand over to Tawana, who is going to uh, share his thoughts with us. I wasn't also. going to speak again, given the air time I had this morning. So, but yes, several things said by lots of people here, including Nick and others, made me reflect on the, not the idea of inequalities, because there are many inequalities. So please let me tell you fairly quickly about the story of my university, which is historically a white Africans university, right? Which some people still think is, it is like that. Actually, 70% of the students are black and 57% are women. And when I recently mentioned this at the University of Kyoto in Japan, the president, they said to his female vice president, you hear that, it's your KPA. How are you going to do that? <laughs> Which was strange because in Japan, it's an interesting society. All over the room were seven women standing and bowing. The only woman sitting was the deputy vice chancellor and the guy. But the guy thought that the problem of not having women was the woman's problem, but <laughs> we haven't done that. Yeah. So here is the problem is that at my university, then the inequalities are at various levels. They are socioeconomic, they are about family, background, social capital, the school we have gone to, and, and all of that, including rural schools. We want everybody in. That's our notion of inclusivity. But we still lag behind in students from lower socioeconomic groups, whether they are white or black, male or female. So what we've decided to, to do is to reflect upon our status as an ivory tower and to say, yeah, we're a university, but people end up at university, they come from somewhere. And that we can't keep thinking that the basic, that's what we call it, basic education system or primary and high school is not our problem. Because one of the things we faced was that we don't have enough students with STEM and we want to be a 55% STEM-based university but we're not getting enough STEM qualified students to, to reach that target, if you like. So then we realized that the high schools and the primary schools don't teach mathematics very well. But we said, of course, it's not our problem. We only get those we want, but we can't reach our target. And, and, and so the, 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 the idea went on. So we decided that actually high schools and primary schools are our problem. We have a faculty of education, does its job, trains teachers, but that's not enough. So we have decided to create a pre-university academy. And the pre-university academy's idea, to be, to be truthful, we stole from our students, especially the medical students. They decided that they are for their community engagement, they will involve themselves in low-income communities and help the students with their STEM subjects, help them apply to the university, make them aware of opportunities and in fact, they become an independent recruiting agency for, our, for us. And I have a, a dinner every year with them to thank them for that. So, but now we decided to institutionalize that, to say you need an institution in the university that really be, works with high schools and primary schools 
and build their capacity and social capital to engage in coming to a university. And so I think that we're finding that that is very, very interesting because quite sets of different people, including schools, school principals, and teachers also have decided to say they need some skills that we could provide them. And so our idea of growing the pipeline and not delinking ourselves from the entirety of the education system might begin to address some of the inequalities. So one of our partners, uh, and I'm signing this agreement on Monday, Skins College London, they decided to be interested in that project. I did, that's not what I was selling to them, something else. <laughs> so, so, so it's interesting that we could now, we're beginning to think we could perhaps build a movement towards pre-university academies that complement and work in partnership with the high school and primary school system to build the capital necessary to be able to access university education. Thank you, that's inspiring. Always, as you speak to Anna, there's always some inspiring nugget that comes out. That uh, It made me think, actually, when I started at the University of Leeds many, many years ago, the only Yorkshire local accents you heard on campus were um, nurses and dental nurses. And all of the other students didn't have a local or regional accent. I'm sure it's different now, but, but it speaks to uh, who are we the ivory tower, who are we bringing on this, I love that vessel, who's in this big boat, this vessel that we're, and you're, you're, you've put a nice, a, a brilliant walkway now for more people to come into your vessel because you've been, thought about that, it's really interesting. Is that open education? Is, I don't know, I'm just throwing that open, it's going right back to the start, is, is that open education that you've just described? Yes, I think that, you know, University is at the apex of the education system and is fairly close by, by design that only a few people end up at the university. So it's not open. It has to be open if you are really talking about society from those who aspire and have the potential to go through the system. So thinking of a pipeline rather than the end game where the brightest, as we, we normally say in our marketing literature, the brightest and the bright young minds <laughs> as if the rest are not, but is there bottlenecks throughout, which are structural in terms of the education system. I think we have to think about the notion of lifelong education as well. And also we, we have, um, my last comment, we've created an interesting institution at our university, the Center for the Future of Work, which seeks to study the relationship between the education system, the universities, and the labor market and how that could be articulated in interesting ways. In short, we lack an articulated education system from the crag to the grape. Thank you. I'm going to come to you, but also I just wanted to say, you were saying who ends up at university, and as you said, um, all of the people around us are, are in the university. They don't, we don't, you know, the, the, the people who are marvelously working the, the tech and who greeted us and everything else. So it's a, it's a big community, it's not, yeah. Um, sorry. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, really enjoyed both Gino's and Karen's talk, and um, going to try and pick up um, succinctly, if I can, on a few points that's been made. But I, it's about access, and I think I was reflecting when Gino was speaking about access to natural resource. I was thinking about the water and imagining where it might be. But I just want to come back that we really need to start a lot earlier if we're going to influence access and make it more open. And I was thinking what Nick was saying about Air Hills and where you're working with communities um, that have a different view about education and priorities. And we've got to understand the barriers better. So for example, um, I'm not saying it's just Air Hills, but in the UK, in some communities, young people, they don't want to stay in education because, for example, um, some young girls, they know that if they get pregnant, they get out of their system, they get into a house, and so education isn't on their radar. So we have to understand the barriers as well as, because if you don't change the perceptions, you don't change the attitudes, and you don't change the behaviors. And then I was thinking about what Tuana was saying earlier about how do we get more from the global south to the global north to get that knowledge exchange. And I was thinking about the communities that I work in. 
we've always had a strong capacity building and we've always taken whatever our research is, it's usually alternative supplementary livelihoods, we find the issue we, and then we go back to it. How do we co-create the solution? How do we co-design? So my question is really, or the provocation, is about access. And unless we actually start early in the education system and then recreate ways that people can get access from all different backgrounds, I don't think we'll ever change it. I think we've still got a lot of work to do. And that's what I think through this network, we can perhaps be a little bit more creative how we get that access. You didn't tell us your name. Sorry, Selena Stead. I'm the Executive Dean for the Faculty of Environment here at the University of Leeds. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to come to you and then I'm going to Gina, I think. Oh, yeah, we've got five minutes left, so we'll thank you. Sorry. Thank you very much. Louise Bryant, University of Leeds with Kendi, co-dean for EDI. So I am um, a resident of Leeds, so I didn't come to university and I came to University of Leeds when I was 30. So I didn't have the usual trajectory. I was a mature student by, by quite a way when I came here. But I've also got some reflections on what I th thought about the University of Leeds before I even thought of coming here as an academic, which I think might be helpful about this. Many people in these are actually, they may not be working at the university or gone to the university, but they recognise the university as a central part of, well, the un we, ha we are a university city. Let's not just talk about this one university, okay? The universities in this city are very important to the people in these. They are partly prestige, they bring in a lot of income for lots of people in this community, okay? And I think we need to think about our position and I think this is speaking to every single body here because no matter what university you work in in whatever part of the world you are privileged aren't you we're pr very privileged to be here today in this building talking about these interesting things and um, so I think we just need to we need to, to recognize that and think also about the potential that we have within our own cities in our own places to do these very practical things that Karen taught to us about. So within the University of Leeds, we have um, a lifelong learning centre, which does fantastic work. It does not just assume that the young woman that has a, a teenage pregnancy will, will no longer then want to engage in education. It is throughout life. And thinking about that and what access to education means. And I think I am a big supporter of, of decolonisation. Kendi knows that. But actually, decolonisation to me is all about who's the elite. And the elite is not just, you know, white people in, in universities. There are great inequalities with it within the city of Leeds. And so I think it is about opening up our buildings as a university city, the cultural artefacts that we have. Masood's not here, but, you know, he's our librarian is amazing in that respect. We've already got so much to actually make use of. What we don't tend to do is perhaps to put a lot, to give a lot of emphasis and credit things to the Lifelong Learning Centre and what they can do to transform lives. So start from where we've got and really champion those things too. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I should have mentioned that. I'm going to you, then Gina, and then I'm going to stop, I'm afraid. Oh, sorry, I'll, Karen. Okay. I'll keep it quite short, yep. actually. So I was just thinking about the university, thinking about that, that vessel we were talking about and the watering hole and the little bridges that we are talking about, bringing people in. Um, but the question is, is it, what is a university? Is it a place, a physical place, space? And why is it that we assume people must always come to, ha to us? Can we go to them? Uh, Sal Haiya is from the Open University in Sudan and she was telling us about the amazing work that they're doing with the Open University there and the way it is transforming people's lives by taking education to them where they are and engaging them in a way that is meaningful to them. Thank you. Love, thank you very much. Gino and then Karen. I, th I think I'm oh. still Mike. Oh, you're Am still I? Mike, yeah. Okay, so like, um, just to speak directly, yeah, we, we're speaking a lot about access. Let's speak about sharing. And I think that when we're speaking about access here, we're saying who should get access. Open up. Provide the opportunity for anyone, everyone, whoever wants access, whoever can benefit from you 
having put things out there in an open manner, you're still going to be attributed. You don't know where it's going to land, where that fruit, let me use another nature analogy here, is going to sprout. You know, we are trying to control knowledge and opening up is an action of putting things out there and seeing what happens. We are limiting the potential by trying to keep our grasp on resources that was made with everyone's tax money. And we, we want to channel it, sorry to use your piping, um, but we want to pipe it here and there and there. And, and by saying here, there, we're missing here. We're missing everywhere else. So open up, share, and see what happens. But empower people in the spaces. Maybe do that as a way to help them to utilize those resources to their best benefit. Yeah. Open up. I think, yeah, we'll have share and open always in the same sentence now. Uh, uh, Karen, do you want to, sorry. Oh, you've got the... I don't need the mic. Oh, um, your mic. Yeah, sorry, so Karen. Mic. Uh, okay. Well, I, I mean, I've been in love with where the conversation has been going, um, but one of the things that I've been thinking about in the last few um, uh, kind of minutes or so is uh, where the creation of all of this might come from. I mean, th I think th th taking uh, Tawana's point, um, yes, universities could be the, the conduit and the branch and the space, um, but uh, at least within the UK context, if we think about education, we have Saturday schools. We have a whole set of things that people have done in the community. They haven't waited for somebody mm. from any official system to tell them that it's okay for them to create opportunities for others to engage and share knowledge and, and produce that. Um, and and, there, and, and I, I think that may be part of the, the, the resources, wherever they may come from, to think about where they might be starting up and then actually bridging them all together. Um, if people so choose, in ways that could be quite powerful, um, as, as opposed to thinking it needs to be generated from the university structure yeah. and then disseminated out um, in different ways. Yeah, tap into the existing successful ways of doing these things. Well, no, I mean, well it's not necessarily that they're successful, well, it's well. just that these are, they are spaces where communities have mobilized yeah. Yeah. to create these sets of, of, um, of structures. Okay. Um, and, uh, and they, they they, they're, not, they're not part of the education system. No. Um, okay. But they are, they are knowledge, right? Yeah. Um, I'd just like to thank you all so much for participating in this conversation. As I said, it, it's, it, it went in ways I didn't expect it to, but that's, that's part of it. That's brilliant. And um, now Abby and I have to try and capture that magic and uh, feed it back. But thank you so much, and thank you to our speakers.